This past week I was listening to a former instructor, somebody who used to instruct at the um, college and uh, provide instruction in the church, who is no longer associated with the Church of God but teaches in another organization, and I happened to see him online. He was covering a subject that uh, I had some interest in, thought I would listen a bit to him, and it was... Um, clear that this individual no longer holds our view of adherence to certain practices, certain uh, beliefs and practices that we do uh, and have done, of course, for decades in the church, he no longer feels is necessary because of his particular uh, understanding and belief and conviction about what's required of a Christian. And he uses uh, similar arguments in his discussion that I happened to listen to online. He used similar arguments that others would utilize to justify their not following uh, specific uh, teachings that we would say are found in the Bible and required for us as Christians. It's not that the, the concept and the argument is totally wrong. It, it, what's important is how it's applied and, and to what. That, of course, is the key. And it goes something, uh, you probably heard it or read it over the years in one way or another, that we're now in the new covenant. We are under the new covenant. We're not under Moses' covenant of the Old Testament. We are saved by grace. We serve God, but serving God doesn't mean you wear prayer tassels. Some of these little things that hang from your, your garment. We don't do that. We don't have to do that anymore in order to be a Christian. You don't have to give a precise percent of your income in order to be a Christian and in order to serve God. You don't have to refrain from eating certain meat. There are certain things you can eat and certain things you can't eat. That's not a part of the new covenant, what we're called to, what we're under with God's Spirit. You don't have to worship on a particular day. It's not about a day of the week. The law is not going to save you. And on and on you can go with these various uh, examples of what's not necessary when you come under the new covenant, when you're saved by grace, when you're within Christ and so on, and you walk through this uh, explanation or argument that anytime you feel something's not necessary, it's easy to claim that others feel, oh, that's going to save you. Oh, that's what makes you so special. Oh, that makes you God's people. Because, well, you won't eat certain meats. Now you're supposed to be. And you apply that to the individuals as though those individuals feel, well, that's what's necessary for salvation. This, that, or the other thing of and by itself. And it was kind of interesting because he was going back and forth with a partner there uh, in, in uh expounding on the scriptures, and the partner was explaining how he did practice certain good works that came right out of the scriptures. And you know, I do certain things, and God commands us to do this, but I don't believe those things save me. Well, that's the whole point there. Nobody thinks anything they do in any church, or they shouldn't, we certainly don't, think that those individual acts save you of and by themselves. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10. I think we know this, but it was interesting how we have one argument doing away with so many things we feel are necessary, and, and the partner turning around and saying, well, I do various Christ, good Christian work, oh, but I don't think they save me. Well, sure. Nothing does in the way of works of and by itself. Galatians 3 and verse 10, as many are as of the works of the law are under a curse. We're looking to our obedience what we adhere to, that will earn me my salvation. For it's written, you're going to end up cursed, everyone that continues not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. If you look to your good work, your effort, that alone, you're going to fall short. And then you don't deserve the kingdom because you're trying to earn it. You're becoming very legalistic. You're cursed if you're trying to earn salvation. Romans 3.31, of course, there's another side of the whole issue. Romans 3.31. Here now, Paul is very careful. Do we then make void the law through faith? Well, you can go way off, swing way over on the other side. Do we make void the law because we now have faith and grace and forgiveness? Oh, for God forbid, don't even go there. It's kind of his response. We, we're, really, we establish a righteousness. I had not known what sin was except 
God's spiritual law. Tell me. Then one other in James chapter 2 and verse 18. James 2, 18. Faith is certainly required by grace. Are you saved through faith? Yes, a man may say you have faith in James 2.18, and I have works. Well, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you the kind of faith I have by what I practice. That's going to define whether you have the faith of Christ or whether you have the faith of men. You show me your faith, you boast about your faith, how religious you are, how dedicated you are, how you give to the poor, all the various things. I'll show you what my faith is all about by my works, what I do, what I practice, what I follow. You see then in verse 24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So here we are back to the sometimes confusing and challenging, no question about it, sometimes challenging issue of what does the new covenant require of Christians? Those that desire to walk in Christ's footsteps and observe the things he commanded. Go and teach them all things whatsoever I've taught you to observe. What do you do? What things from the Old Testament? Therein is the challenge. Because as I mentioned, the early argument, oh, well, that's not going to save. Oh, you're going to abstain from certain means. Oh, you think the law. Oh, you're going to earn yourself. That's not the point. What is it that we're required to do? None of which of and by itself is going to save us by just doing those particular things. Well, we're coming to four important observances now in the fall of the year. Festivals of God. They're not exactly the same observances that you had in the, under the Old Covenant. We don't blow trumpets on a Feast of Trumpets. Nobody's going to be doing it unless somebody has one, wants to do so. have done that once or twice over the years. But we're not required to do that. We don't build booths. It was a part of the instruction, but we don't do that. Like the Jews did, those temporary dwellings that they built, there was instructions what to do about it. We don't bake certain loaves of bread on Pentecost and bring them to church and consume them or eat them. There's things we don't do, but we do fast on the Day of Atonement. We don't eat the unleavened, uh, the leavened products during unleavened bread. You like some things you do, some things you don't do. It's a challenging issue. It certainly is in, in trans, transforming from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. Some would say it's very strange that we keep these days at all. These old covenant Jewish days. They're not uh, an obligation in the New Testament. We've got the grace. We've got Christ. We've fulfilled it all. And that same argument, which would apply to some things, but not all things. Most people do. A little bit of a challenge. Here you go back into the old covenant law again. That'd be, that would certainly be the sentiment or the argument, not under that old covenant. Well, we know that discussions of God's law, God's way, his commandments, created a, a degree of turmoil in the early New Testament church because it can be a challenging issue. Look at uh, Titus chapter 3 and verse 9. Titus 3, 9. It was a challenge in the New Testament church. What do you do? What do you not do? Titus 3.9, the instruction to Titus is avoid foolish questions and go on and on. What's the end result of that? I mean, how, how critical is that particular question anyway? Avoid foolish questions, getting into the genealogies, whatever that was, whatever that was all about and how important that was. Various contention, contentions, strivings about the law. What aspect are you required to do from the Old Covenant and what do you do? What do you do in the Law of Moses and what does a Christian do? There was a lot about that as far as the Gentile community. What do they have to adopt? So getting into strivings about all of that, it's not profitable. It ends up creating strife and actually division. We know they had the very intense Jerusalem conference over uh, circumcision, 
brought all the ministry together to Jerusalem. Some were claiming, and they were right to the scriptures. Here's where it says about circumcision, and this is required. And he, Paul, the Apostle Paul was applying the principles of the new covenant and went back to Abraham, and uh, there were a lot of convictions on both sides of that. It said a lot of contention until uh, Peter and James settled the matter and kind of enlightened everybody as to how this from the old covenant would or would not apply to a Christian. You don't wipe away everything, nor do you bring everything over from the Jewish community or the old covenant. It can be certainly challenging. The apostles, of course, strove to keep a balance between a grace which turns into license. Oh, we can be forgiven. Oh, we don't earn our salvation. Well, we're free to move along in life as we please. They were striving to find and to teach a balance. You find both in avoiding a grace that turns into license, which appeals to a human nature, which allows you the freedom, unlike we heard in the sermonette where we're examining, judging ourselves, it allows you the freedom to come under this grace and forgiveness and to continue in a carnal way of life. So they're striving to keep that out of the church and at the same time striving to make sure that uh, we're not turning into legalism. Our our specific observances uh, make us so much better than everybody else. We look to our own righteousness. So there's both, both aspects of that. Now, mainstream Christianity, interesting enough, they do have observances, don't they? Well, two primary ones, Christmas and Easter. The Catholic Church, we had a number of other observances. Even the night before uh, or Halloween, you know, the next day is All Souls Day, the Catholic. That's a holiday. And there were a number of other ones. At least you have Christmas and Easter. So the churches do have observances, as well as Sunday, Sunday church. Churches have things they recognize. They observe these days that highlight elements of their Christian faith. Nothing uncommon about that. They feel they're important uh, observations, or things that they observe, I should say, and, and follow. They were very uh, solemn in the Catholic Church. You were commanded. You were commanded to go to church every Sunday and Christmas and Easter and those holidays or it was a mortal sin. Now, you had venial sins. They're more minor. And you had a mortal. That you go to hell if you don't confess to the priest and get forgiven. Those were mortal sins. Christmas, Easter, and some of these other holidays. Of course, going to church on Sunday. So they they looked at it in a very solemn way. So what's so bad, we would say, what's so bad about God's church keeping the days that come right out of the scriptures? What's so bad about that idea? They're right there. God said to observe them. They're my holy day. What's so wrong about keeping the ones that you find in the Bible? Well, again, we need to periodically review our unique approach to this topic. Were the holy days for the old covenant only, and the vast majority would argue, of course, they're the Jewish days found in the uh, priestly book of Leviticus. Obviously, a Christian would not be observing those today. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. God's holy days, of course, here it's hearkening, here's the New Testament, Paul writing to the Corinthian church about these specific days. God's holy days explain his plan and way of life. God's holy days explain his plan 
and way of life. Let's read John chapter 8 and several verses here in the Gospel of John. Now here Jesus is kind of caught, some would say, and they tried to catch him between the Old Covenant and his new teaching. They tried to pin him down. It's a crucial clash because you did have from God a covenant established with God himself. Now you have Jesus, son of God, and this new covenant. What do you do? What do you not do? How do you apply it? Now they're going to pin him down in John chapter 8. So Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people, of course, were coming to him, and he sat down and he taught them. Now the scribes and the Pharisees have this circumstance they bring before him. Here's a woman taken right in the act of adultery, caught red-handed. I don't know where the guy is. They didn't bother with him, apparently. Grab the woman. Bring him, to all, uh, of all places, to Jesus. So she was taken in, the, in adultery, and they now sit her down in the midst of them. Okay, what are you going to do with this woman? We know what the law says. So they said, Master, this woman was taken in adultery, caught you know, red-handed. No question about it. No doubt about the guilt. Now Moses, God's servant from God's law, commanded us that such should be stoned. What are you going to say? Don't do what God says. Don't do what Moses says. So this they said, trying to test him. He's kind of caught, some would think, in the middle that they might have a reason to accuse him, because this was not a part of what he was specifically teaching. So Jesus stoops down with his finger wrote on the ground. We really don't know what he wrote. There's different speculations, but it doesn't tell us. And it was as though he seemed as though, well, I'm just going to go on. I'm not going to deal with what you're trying to do here, this, this situation you're setting up. Now they continue. They're not going to let him get away with it, get off the hook, so to speak. So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and he said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Didn't nullify Moses. Just ask them that question. Something deeper. Something gets more to the heart. Something gets like the sermon and a, and a judge yourself. So then he stooped down and he wrote on the ground, and those which heard it, being convicted in their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing right there with him, just him and her. So he now stands up. He didn't see anybody else around. They're all left in shame, I guess, except the woman. He said unto her, woman, well, where is it? Where are all these people trying to accuse you? What happened to them? The one's trying to condemn you. And she says, no, ma- no there's none, nobody left, Lord. He said unto her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So God instructed physical Israel, that physical nation, here's what you're to do with specific breaking of God's law, violation. And that was from God. That was for the people. Jesus, of course, is coming now to establish the spiritual church And the spiritual church does not administer penalty for sin or law-breaking. That's not our role, not what the church does. We don't stone people. It might violate even the most most, uh, basic of God's law. That isn't the role of the spiritual church. He wasn't nullifying what God said. He just simply responded in a way that handled the circumstances and emphasize something that he was now presenting or starting, meaning the spiritual church. Go and sin no more. There's two very important thoughts or lessons in Jesus' instruction. I'm not condemning you. That's not why I'm here. I've not been made the judge of everybody. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more means Jesus must have had in his own mind some concept of moral law. If he said, don't go and don't sin anymore, well, what do you mean sin? What, what do you, what's a sin? He must have had in his mind a grasp of what a sin was. Go and don't sin anymore. 
So something must define that. And the second part is, go and sin no more, means that humans have the choice whether they're going to do it or not. You go and make the choice not to do this anymore. So there's a choice involved. There's a right and wrong. He, he understood that clearly. And humans have the choice. The world is confused about sin or doesn't care anymore. The world is confused about sin or simply doesn't care. Passover and unleavened bread provide instruction on that topic. Repenting of what? Partaking of unleavened bread? Why? What does that do for us? How does that empower us? Empower us to do what? So God's holy days provide instruction that keep people on a path. Like the rumble strips we heard in the sermonette. You get off track. Well, the world's veering off in all directions with nothing to bring them back. God's holy days do that. The uh, the Feast of Pentecost. God's not calling the world. This is not God's world. You know, we have the natural disasters, and they're truly terrible. Or even worse, it seems like, is human-generated suffering. What man does to other men... What we do to ourselves as human beings, how we treat others, like we heard, heard about again in the sermonette and the man in the, in the concentration camp. All the suffering, all the things that ISIS is doing that you read about, it, just horrific acts of evil men or women do to other human beings. Obviously the question, why would God allow that? How could he? And be the kind of God that he is. That's always, you know, a fundamental question. Not always an easy answer, but what would we want God to do? Somebody goes into a store, they rob the store, and they shoot the owner. Okay, how terrible. How could God allow that? He was a nice man. He used to help people. He used to coach the little league team. Wonderful, wonderful neighbor. Now he's dead. How could God allow that? Or what would we like God to do? That when the person fires the gun, it doesn't go off? Well, you could do that. You click, 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 nothing happened. Could do that. Maybe he's done it at times in, in history. He could do that. Could he maybe back up a little and when the man was going to buy drugs? Maybe he was high on drugs and now needs the money to pay for his drug. Maybe he'd prevent the man from getting addicted to drugs. Then he wouldn't have to rob the store and shoot the person. That'd solve it. You could, do, you could do that. Or maybe he would go back further and change the man's environment, his neighborhood, his parents, what he grew up with. Or maybe he would stop the man from watching violence on TV or going to violent movies. Where does God intervene in this process? Where do we want him to stop, step in? What would he do? Man wants God to intervene. There's no question Man wants God to intervene and prevent others' actions, but not so much our own. Now, now wait a minute here. I'm a free morally. I can make my decision. I want to make my decisions. We want God to intervene for someone else, not necessarily for ourselves. You leave me be. That's generally the approach. Adam and Eve had a choice in the garden. They decided they would go their way as they see things. So they were put out of the garden. Now mankind, as we know, has been fundamentally on his own. It's our own society. That's the way we want it, believe it or not. We don't want evil. That's true. We hate to see things happen to people. That's true. But we do want the freedom to choose what we want to choose. That we want. Now, maybe not for everybody else, but for certainly for us individually or, or personally. So we live in a world right now, in an age, where people and nature are on their own. The natural surroundings, the cycles, the wind and the rain, the hurricanes, they come and they go. Nature happens. People do things. You have the good and the bad. We live in a world where people and nature are on their own. We hope that we end up within a government where there's order, where there's law, 
where there's some kind of orderliness and not chaos and anarchy. That's where we're moving. We used to live in a very obedient, very orderly society. Our Christian heritage, Christianity, teaches people to adhere to the government, the laws. We're law-abiding people if you're Christian. You believe in God's law. You believe in a respect for the laws of the country you live in. You have an orderly, you tend to have an orderly society, and you, you respect the officers that keep the law because you respect law. So there's order and there's peace, relatively speaking, at least compared to history. All of that is sliding away for some of the very reasons we see in God's, God's holy days. So it's a world that's on his own. No, uh, uh, going its own way. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans eight twenty-eight. Romans eight twenty-eight. we know all things work together for good to them that love God, those who are called. There's some called out of the chaos, the darkness, the confusion, the why doesn't God? How could God? What's right, what's wrong. Some are called out of that. Called according to God's purpose, Ephesians 1.18. Ephesians 1.18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Somehow a light has gone on in our mind. We didn't turn it on ourselves. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Called out of the world. Called into light. Been enlightened. Oh, now I know why the world's the way it is. Now I know why people do what they do. Now I know what's going on. Fundamentally. In the world in which we live. Now I see it. What are the riches, the glory of the inheritance of the saints? Well, I'm not going to go through an explanation and walk through each holy day. Don't have to do that. We do that and will you know, as we come up to the, the Feast of Trumpets. But just to make the point and, and rehearse, the holy days are a guide others do not have. Hold, the holy days of God, the observance of are a guide to life, to the journey through life. And the world in which we see it guides us, it enlightens us, it directs us, they keep us on the path. Others do not have that, and people that leave the church, you've met them, people that have been a part of the church for maybe years and have left the church, all of that fades. All of it strangely fades away. Even what the Holy Days stood for, they're back into a context of the world and its religions and its way. As though they maybe never even Knew it in the first place. It seems lost. Well, as I mentioned, I'm not going through each of the holy days. I do want to, I do want to take the rest of the time just to rehearse the basic reason then that we do do these old covenant holy days listed in Leviticus, and although not only there. Why do we do that? Point number one would be. Jesus kept these days. Now, nobody really doubts that. Any church, any religion can see, well, Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and yes, Jesus went to the feast, and Jesus did such and such. We know it sets an example for us, but most people would dismiss that. Well, sure, he was a Jew, and he hadn't died yet. The new covenant hadn't arrived. It hadn't been established. It hadn't been ratified. Sure, he's going to do that. That doesn't mean anything. Well, it does to us, as we put the whole story together, Jesus did keep them. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26, because we see here in Matthew 26, beginning verse 18, Jesus does show he did not do away with the holy days, but he did change the focus. He didn't say, oh, forget about that. Oh, that day, that day and that time of the year, don't, don't worry about that. Here's what we're going to do. Matthew 26, I should turn there too. And verse 18, here's an example 
that Jesus gives us, a principle, I think we can look at. Go into the city to such a man and say unto him, The master says, My time is at hand. I'll keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. Okay, sure, he was a Jew. That's before he died. But then in verse um, 26, now he's instructing them. They're going to go on after he dies. Yeah, don't forget about these things. This is our last one of these together. You know, we're all Jews. We've got to do one more. Then you're free. We're not going to be doing this anymore. We've got different days we're going to set up. You're going to do my birthday, and we're going to, you're going to take, take note of when I'm resurrected, because that's going to be your day of worship. There are no instructions like that. Verse uh, 26 as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke and gave to his disciples, said, Take, eat, this is my body. He took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, saying, Drink you all of it, this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, should be, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And we go right on. We're going to keep the Passover. Now, here's what you're going to do. Bread and wine. We now have a New Testament context to the Holy Day. No, no clear instruction about forgetting it. Still have the Passover, but it adjusts to a New Testament symbols and context. With, of course, a great deal deal of meaning. We find also, another point, the New Testament church continued to observe these days. That's the indication that the New Testament church continued to observe them. Acts 12 and verse 3. Acts 12, verse 3. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also, and then were the days of unleavened bread. Kind of like a natural marker. Natural reference to that. It's clear they had a Passover observance in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the last half of the chapter. Obviously, that's what they were doing, what Jesus had instructed them to do, and Paul took them to task for the manner in which they were doing that solemn evening and occasion. Just, they were doing what Jesus said in, in a wrong way. Obviously, that was their observance. Acts 20, in verse 6, Acts 20, verse 6. So we sailed away from Philippi in Acts 20, in verse 6. We sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. Why mention them? If if it didn't have something to do with what you you were doing and how you timed things, your travels. We sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them unto Troas in five days and then stayed seven days in verse 16. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend time in Asia for he was in a hurry, if possible, for him to be in Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. Pentecost? Why would he care? What, what, what's that mentioned for? Oh, you're just using that for your own advantage. and You're, you're interpreting that the way you, you want to see it. Well, here's the Expositor's Bible Commentary. This is volume 9, page 507, if, if you wanted to write that down. Expositor's Bible Commentary says, Having been unable to get to Jerusalem for Passover, Paul remained at Philippi to celebrate it, and the week-long Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's how they see it. And they get the Church of God writing that Expositor's Bible commentary. They remained at, he remained at Philippi to celebrate it and the week-long Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's why he stayed there. He kept it. Here's from the Life and Epistles of, the, of, the, uh, of St. Paul, Coney Bear, and Housen. Quote, There seems no difficulty in supposing that the Gentile Christians joined with the Jewish Christians in celebrating the Paschal Feast after the Jewish manner, at least to the extent of abstaining from leaven at the love feasts. And we see that Paul still observed the days of unleavened bread at this period of his life. That's what they see. Well, that's what we think we see too. So the early New Testament church... They, there they were. 
No clear, distinct instruction from the apostles. Hold it, hold it, hold it. No, don't do that. Even Gentiles doing it, according to these commentaries. The Christians looked like a sect of the Jews. They just didn't look that much different. Sabbath day, seventh day of the week, meeting on that day, same holidays, same, same laws. Looked like Jews to, to most everybody else. Finally, a, a fourth point is that these holy days, or the scriptures, there's a lack of an explanation abolishing the holy days. There's a lack of an explanation, a clear explanation where, okay, we see that is not necessary. Like you have a resurrection chapter in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, here's a clear explanation of the resurrection. Where's the clear explanation about abolishing these holy days that aren't that they're not necessary and the scriptures the few three or four that you would turn to and say well there when you look at them they don't say that we'll we'll look at those in just a moment let's read acts 21 now acts 21 remember we had this huge discussion traumatic decision in acts 15 over circumcision Get, get all the elders together. This is huge. Do the Gentiles have to be circumcised? Argument back and forth, a contention. It's quoting the scriptures over circumcision. Can you imagine the Sabbath day, the holy days? It'd have to be equally. You'd have to say there'd be something. Acts 21 19. Acts 21 19. So when Paul had saluted them, he's coming now to Jerusalem. He declared particularly what things God had wrought through his ministry and his effort among the Gentiles. So when they heard it, they they were thankful to God. They they recognized God was working with him and said unto him, Oh, now look, here's the reality, Paul. You see how many thousands of Jews there are that believe. A lot of Jews coming into the church, they're accepting Christ as the Messiah, but they're still Jews (laughs) through and through. It's going to take them a while. They're very zealous of the law, and they're informed about you. They're, they're, they're hearing that you teach all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forget about Moses. That's what they're here you're teaching. Forget about Moses and the law of the Old Testament, saying that they ought not circumcise. Circumcise their children. That's what was getting to them. Where is the instruction from Paul about the Sabbath? The holy days, meats that we should still refrain from. No no hint of that. They're all upset of you because they they hear yours. This is after the Jerusalem conference. They hear your teaching that they don't have to circumcise their children. That's, That's the charge. None of the others. Let's go look at a couple verses. We begin to wrap up this thought for today. Kind of a review of our teaching on it, as well as preparation for the days that are coming up here very shortly. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2. Go to Colossians chapter 2. We always say it's important to get the context of things. So Paul is writing to the members here in Colossae. And notice in verse 8 he says, Now beware lest any man... You take note of these men that are coming in. They've got their idea, their, their approach to all of this. Beware lest, lest any man do this and try to, try to deceive you in some way. And then uh, I think he says it a little bit, verse 18, Let no man beguile you. Well, here comes somebody else. That's what he says in verse 16. Let no man, therefore... Judge you. Now, the King James says, don't let anybody judge you about what you're eating, what you're drinking. All of the, oh, yeah, you're not going to eat this. That makes you a Christian. All this minute. So that isn't what Christian, that isn't what the New Testament is all about, New Covenant. Don't let anybody start judging you about, you can eat this. No, you can't eat that. Respect of any of these holy days and new moon or Sabbaths. Well, verse 16, when you get the proper translation, it's not 
talking about what you eat or what you drink. It has nothing to do with specifically what are you eating, what are you drinking. It's about the act of eating and drinking. It's about eating and drinking, enjoying food and drink. That's what they're being judged by. The Gnostics felt eating, celebrating, like we do on a holy day, that that was indulging the flesh. You don't do that. You went to a feast day and you had a meal in between. You had a potluck and you were enjoying eating. That's not holy. Gnostics thought you deny yourself. That's how you're really going to be holy. And that's what it says later, later in the chapter as the context. Here it says, verse 21, this idea, touch not, taste not, handle not, all of which are to, uh, to perish with the using after the commandments and the doctrines of men. Oh, they have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship. Ooh, how righteous and stoical. How strong in the faith. They don't eat this and they won't do that and they're very serious. Don't let anybody judge you because you're eating and you're drinking on these observances. That's what it was about. Not stop these observances. Or don't worry about what you're eating and so on. Galatians chapter 4. So these would be a couple of the verses. There's one or two others, but Galatians chapter 4. Verse 8, These we've seen that there really isn't anything abolishing them, and now here are the ones that supposedly do. Galatians 4, verse 8. He says, Now, how be it then, when you knew not God, when you didn't know God, probably not referring to the Jews, who they did have the true God, Howbeit then when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature were not gods. That'd be more of the Gentile people. They didn't know God. They were worshiping all these false idols and false gods. Well, now after you have known God, or rather are known of God, how are you drifting back to these various beggarly elements where God's holy days and observances, that's how you would characterize them? Whereunto you desire to be in bondage. You observe day. there it is, days, months, times, and years. He said, oh, that's just terrible. I'm afraid, lest, uh, afraid of you, lest you be stowed upon you my labor in vain. Now you're drifting back to a Sabbath day. Here you go back to another observance of these special days throughout the year. Is that really what he's saying? He doesn't live. Well, you're going back to the Sabbath. Now you're going back to unleavened. He doesn't list that and clarify that. Isaiah 47, if you want to just jot this down, it's a good scripture to have in your margin. Isaiah 47, 13. You are wearied in the multitude of your counsels. Let now the astrologers, oh, that had crept into Israel from the pagan practices. Let now the astrologers, which God condemned, the stargazers, where are the stars and how are they aligned and whether we should do this or that, consult the stars. The astrology, looking up to the heavens for the guidance. Astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly pronosticators. What month is it? What time of the month? Stand up and save you from these things that shall come upon you. That's what was going on. They were drifting back into certain pagan observances and practices. Not what God had given. You wouldn't characterize what God gives in this way. God gave ancient Israel. He would respectfully say, well, we don't have to do that. So Galatians chapter 4 sounds like it, that they're observing days and you don't have to. It's which days? For which purpose? What were they going back to before they knew God? So is it really a clear-cut verse that now we're loosed, you might say, from observance of these annual holy days? Well, finally, in, in Hebrews chapter 4, for a final verse, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Verse 12. 
We believe the scriptures that we're reading, our faith is that the Word of God is living. What do you mean living? It's just a book. Words in a book. No, we believe they, they have life. There's spiritual life in the words. Jesus said, my words are life. Well, that's what th- this is. They're, they're life and truth. So we believe, as it says in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick. It's living. Very powerful when it is applied in the way it's meant. Very powerful. Like Jesus said, well, the stones would cry out because it's written that there would be shouting when I ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. The stones would shout. That's how powerful it is. It's written that way. The Word of God is living. It's powerful, very sharp. <laughs> when it wants to get to the heart of something, very sharp. And Jesus certainly knew how to use that effectively. So it's very sharp. Sharper than any kind of two-edged sword that people might sharpen. And it pierces even the dividing asunder right to the soul and to the heart and the spirit of somebody's very life. Either to humble them as they, their eyes are open to themselves, their own, what they are, their carnality, their carnal mind, enmity against God. I've mentioned before that I've met people over the years, well, I've always loved God. <laughs> I've loved God from, since when I was a child. Well, maybe you were religious, and maybe you, did have a, maybe you did have a tender heart in some respects. But what you're trying to say is you never did have the carnal mind all other human beings have. You never had that. <laughs> you always loved, loved God and wanted to follow God. Well, that's not true. Not in our deepest heart. Well, the, the scriptures, God's word, gets down to the very moral discerner, of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and when the thoughts and the intent of our heart condemn us, discourage us, God's word lifts us, enlightens us, encourages us. The God of peace provides comfort through the scriptures, does both, powerful. So we believe that about the Bible. It has spiritual life in its words gives life. God uses it to sustain spiritual life in his people. That's why we read it. That's why we try to preach from it. Well, we believe the holy days have life in them as well. They're not just dead observances. Well, they're old, dead observances, and we're dragging them out of the grave. You know, they got buried with the old covenant. We dig them out and put them on our backpack, and we wear those old days that are dead. I don't believe that. Believe the holy days have life in them. They're living, not just dead, not old covenant days. Don't believe that. Don't see that for the brief things that I've given you here this afternoon as well as others. So we can't give them lip service, can we? Can't give the Bible lip service and just skim over it and not think about it. And can't give the holy days lip service. Well, we'll just show up. And then we've kept it. That's legalism. Well, I'll be there. Well, if I get myself in the chair, in the seat, I did that in the Catholic Church. I've told you that before. You can come a little bit late and you leave a little early. There's, there's markers. If you're in by this time, you went to church. And once you got to a certain point, you could leave. You always saw a certain number of people get up and leave. And some stayed till the end. But you made it. That was the legalistic, I got my church in. I went. I didn't commit a mortal sin. I went to church. Mass on Sunday. I'll come to the Holy Day. Well, that's legalism. Accomplishes nothing. You think that saves you. It doesn't save anything. So we must apply each day to ourselves if we to continue to desire walking in the plan of God. That's for all of us to do. What does this day mean to me? What should I think about? Well, we try to expound that for all of us, at least in part, each time we come. We must apply each day to ourselves if we desire to continue walking in the plan of God. So let's know why we keep the holy days we do and why they are God's holy days and not only for the old covenant.